A kindergarten teacher had suddenly taken ill one day and a replacement was hastily found. The substitute teacher, however, normally taught the older grades and so had very little experience when it came to teaching a kindergarten class. And so, other than teaching the curriculum, she was at a loss as to what to do during the children's free time. So, she decided she would tell them stories. And after telling each of these stories, she would then say, and the moral of the story is, and then explain to the children the moral. Well, after a number of days of teaching this class and dozens of stories, the children had heard many moral lessons. Finally, the regular teacher had recovered from her illness and returned back to her class. One of the children came up to her and said, Teacher, I'm so glad that you are back with us. I like you much better than that other teacher. Well, the regular teacher was rather flattered but curious and so asked, Why do you like me better? And the little girl looked her in the eye and said, Because you don't have any morals. <laughs> Well, according to the book of Genesis, the world was devoid of morals during the time of Noah, except for him and his family. Indeed, our story from the Old Testament today, the story of Noah and his ark, is one of the best known stories in all literature. So I am going to move with you right to the very heart of the story, which takes place after the waters had receded. According to the book of Genesis, God says the following to Noah and his family. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I'll remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Interestingly enough, according to anthropologists, many cultures around the entire world have their story of an ancient world encompassing flood. For those of us of the Jewish or Christian faith traditions, however, the most important part of the story is the covenant, the promise that God has with all of humanity. The story as recorded in the book of Genesis tells us that every time we see a rainbow, there's more going on here than merely the light's rays being refracted through droplets of water. It's to be also a reminder of God's covenant to us, a reminder of God's love, a reminder that even though there are times in which God will be very disappointed with us as human beings, that never again will God destroy the world by a flood. The rainbow is the only celestial event recorded in the Hebrew scriptures that is given any sort of divine purpose. The story of Noah and the ark should, I think, be required reading for our time. Not because of all that wonderful imagery of the animals peacefully coming into the ark two by two, but because of another flood I think we are surely now in the presence of. Now our flood is not one of water, but rather it is multifaceted and is far less obvious but no less deadly. Our flood has come in the form of ultraviolet rays, making their way through the ever-thinning umbrella of ozone protecting our world. Our flood has come in the form of ever-increasing garbage, thanks to our consumerism, which is overwhelming our landfill sites. Our flood is coming in the form of liquids, such as nuclear waste, deadly radioactive waste, which have a half-life of thousands of years. Our flood has come in the form of toxic gases, which we put into the very air that we must breathe. This flood 
can also be found on the social front, in which we continue to battle one another even though we say we want peace. Reports of racial violence fill the news. Whether or not you choose to believe that the story of Noah and the Ark is true, what is vitally important, I think, is that we look at the truths within that story and what we can and must learn from them. I'm going to share with you some truths from the story of Noah and the Ark. They are not original to me, and try as I might, I was not able to find out who the author was. However, the comments that I will make about each of these truths are original to me. Don't miss the boat. <laughs> Throughout our lives, opportunities come our way. Opportunities, however, not just to serve ourselves, but more importantly, opportunities to serve God and to serve one another. Remember that we are all in the same boat. Our earth is basically a giant ark which is floating through the ocean of space. This is the only home we have, and we are doing a lousy job of looking after. We must take care of our ark. We must take care of our home. That is what God has charged us to do in the book of Genesis, to take care of ourselves and all the creatures that live upon it, upon which each of us is dependent. Plan ahead. Many people look upon others that just seem to have life so good and they figure, well, they're just plain lucky. But the fact is that's not the case for the most part. My definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. No one his family were not lucky. They were prepared. Stay fit. Now, I don't know about the numbering system in the book of Hebrews, but according to that, Noah was around about 600 years old when God came to him saying, I want you to build an ark. Now, that being said, obviously, Noah and his family had to be in pretty good physical shape in order to do that. But what was even more important, the reason they got this task in the first place was because they were spiritually fit. That is why God called upon them. And the best place for us as people who are people of faith to come in order to stay spiritually fit is here in church among our community of believers. Don't listen to critics. Let's face it, Noah must have taken an awful lot of flack from his neighbors when he started to build the ark along with his family the skies at that time were likely clear. Get on with whatever job, whatever mission you feel God is leading you to do. As Christians, we are to be people of faith. We will miss 100% of the opportunities already if we don't take them on. We need to be people of faith. Build your future on high ground. So many people fail in life because what do they do? They choose to try to build a life on their own strength. And that strength just isn't good enough. If we are to be all that God created us to be, we must build a life upon the sure foundation and guidance of the love of God. For safety's sake, travel in pairs. God created us to be in community, to be one with one another. Think about it. We even think of God in the Christian faith as being in community with God's self. We think of God as God the Creator, God as Christ, and God as the Holy Spirit. Three in one, and yet one, one with all of creation, and that includes us. Speed isn't always an advantage. The cheetahs may have been among the first on board the ship, the ark, but the sloths made it as well. According to the detailed description of the ark, 
it did not have a sail. That tells us that the voyage they went on wasn't about getting to a certain destination, a certain goal, but rather it was all about making the journey. So many people today are in such a hurry to try to make it to their goal. Sadly, by becoming so fixated upon their goals, they soon shut everything else out. And so even if they manage to make it to their goal, they will have lost out on so much along the way. Family, health, friends, that if they meet their goals, they will have lost far more than what they would have actually have gained. When you're stressed, float a while. Another detail of the ark is that it did not have a rudder. It had no means to steer itself. So, what does this mean? It means that not only was building the ark a statement of faith, but the very design of the ark was also a statement of faith. Let's face it, we tend to become stressed over things we have no control over. And the fact is, control itself is the delusion. During such times of stress, we need to just float. We need to just go with the flow. During these last couple of weeks, we've heard about how Jesus would go off on a regular basis by himself in order to pray, to meditate, to be surrounded with God's creation. That, too, is what we must do as well. Meditate, pray regularly, go for a walk, be among God's magnificent creation. It worked for Jesus, and he had the entire weight on his world. You do not, and I do not. So take the time to discover what works for you as an individual, how you are best able to connect with the divine. Do it, and your stress will disappear as if being like a drop of water into a mighty ocean. Remember, the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. The Bible is absolutely filled with stories about how God does not call the equipped, but equips the called. Noah and his family were not called upon to build the ark because they were master builders or experts when it came to the capture and care of animals. No, they were called upon to build the ark because God knew that they would see that mission through. Moses was called upon by God to go speak to the very Pharaoh of Egypt and order him on behalf of God to let the Hebrew people go free. Imagine, especially given that Moses had a severe stutter. David was a shepherd boy who would go on to become the greatest king of Israel. One of the aspects of ministry that I enjoy the most is seeing someone take on a ministry task, perhaps leading a team or a committee of the church and seeing them absolutely blossom as they discover gifts and talents that they never knew they had. Remember this if Margaret approaches you about a job in the upcoming year. <laughs> My very presence here today is proof that God does not call the equipped, but equips the called. No matter the storm, when you are with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. That is the promise of God. While it's true that God has not created an environmental flood or social flood that has risen up before us, we have done it to ourselves, I'm not sure that the distinction really matters all that much. According to the book of Genesis, in the time of Noah, the disaster came upon them because they just chose to ignore God's call. They chose to ignore that they needed to change their ways. Just as the rainbow 
was God's sign to know of a new beginning for all the people. John's baptism of Jesus is an even greater sign of renewal, an even greater sign of salvation for each and every one of us. Out of nowhere, John seems to appear in the wilderness of Judah, inviting those people to come in and to be baptized, to change their lives around, to become the people God created them to be, to prepare for the way of the Messiah. Similarly, Jesus seems to appear out of nowhere. Mark simply tells us in our scripture reading, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus rises up out of the baptismal waters, Mark describes Jesus as having the following experience in which he sees the heavens being torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And then we read, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, attempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. The number 40 is a special one in the Bible. The flood we are told came about because of nonstop rain for 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days and nights, Moses fasted and brought down from the holy mountain of God the Ten Commandments and presented them to the people. For 40 years, the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness until at last they came and entered into the promised land. The 40 days of Lent, not including Sundays, is based upon the 40 days and nights that Jesus spent in the wilderness, staying there among the wild animals, remaining faithful to God rather than choosing to be tempted and follow the ways of the world. The 40 days of Lent is our time for spiritual decision and renewal, just as Jesus had that time. Lent is a time of checking out our life's priorities, our life's focus. It's a time in which we are to discern what beasts might be trying to get at us, to distract us from our God-given mission in life. It's a time in which we are to reflect upon God's promise to us, to forgive us, and to set us free to be the people God created us to be. Our reading from 1 Peter nicely ties in together our other two readings when he says, God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water, and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The rainbow is but one symbol of God's covenant with us, God's promise with us. The cross is an even more important of God's promise of forgiveness and love toward us all. That promise has sustained millions of people throughout the centuries. We know indeed that there will be storms in life, that flood waters will rise, but we also are to know through our faith that God will always be with us in our journey as we turn ourselves over to Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.